Good afternoon. Chair Nolan Eccles, can you see and hear us? Okay. I believe I'm trying to make sure all of my systems are systeming, but I can't okay. see everybody. Okay. How is everybody this afternoon? Pretty good. How are you doing? Pretty good. Same, same. Okay. Commissioner Boba, I sent you the agenda for this work group meeting, did you get it or receive it? I did, I will need to pull that up. This is Sheena, hi everybody. Um, the agenda should also be in the Google Drive on uh, in the work group folder. All right, I believe we start with the roll call, Secretary Bobo. Yes, I will call the roll. So um, at that point, can you say here or present or indicate that you are here? So um, Chair Nolan Eccles. I'm here. Chair Vice Sheridan. Here. Um, Comptroller Green. CD Councilor Hamilton. Present. And Director Gray. Here. Great, thank you. Next item on the agenda, Secretary Bubble. So the next item, I believe we are going to go through um, what was discussed last time, which was the reviewing language, definition, and format areas for amendment, recommendations for discussion related to systemic issues, um, and systemic language updates. Um, and then special meeting recommendations. I hope I'm on the right agenda. I believe so. We just, we had three 
amendments we'd reviewed or requested mm -hmm. that we do from last meeting. Mm -hmm. So we can go over those. And then if I need to also, you know, review the articles as well, I can do that. But I think we have record of that too. Um, okay. Okay, Shana, the work group agenda that is in, I'm gonna try to put this, well, I'm on Zoom, I don't know if I can do that. So on, on the Google, on the Google Drive, did you see, can you see it there? It's also on the website, on our website. Okay, I'm gonna send what I did from last meeting to you guys via email or okay. just attach you to this agenda that I'm looking at, make sure we're all looking at the same one. Yeah. Sending. Okay. Articles overview with comments. State the article titles. Opportunities for improvement opportunities for. So, do we want to skip to on item number three? Mm -hmm. The first thing we issue. So, the vice chair language updates for the articles that we referenced or we found on last work group. Yeah, I'm still doing research on uh, looking at other charters and uh, looking at uh, trying to find some resources so that we can uh, do more, have more gender inclusive language. I don't have a formal update today. Uh, I'm still just at the research stage, I should have something to share by the time we get to the next meeting. I apologize. I'm, I don't apologize. I didn't plan to have anything ready for finishing <laughs> for prime time today, but. No problem. Yeah. Do you plan to have it by public meeting? Uh, I'll have something to share by public meeting, but, and I'm gonna send an email to everybody. I will not be at the public meeting. So I'll, uh, I have to, I'll be out of the country. This will be the one meeting that I'll have to miss, but I'll send it in advance. Okay, it'll work. So um, with that, I mean, I have some comments that kind of tie into that, but mm -hmm. also tie into my part, but I don't want to skip ahead on the agenda. So I'm open to... You can go ahead, Secretary Bobo. Okay, so in Article 8, and I, I, I want to also honor um, Vice Chair that you will be doing some of this research too. So um, sure. I don't wanna you know, reinvent the wheel at all, but within the section one, and this is not the first time that this comes up, but the pronouns, I know that we discussed that. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if it's okay, or a recommendation I guess would be to anywhere that it says the mayor shall appoint the following office officers at his convenience, anytime yeah. it says that, I would like for it to be, or us to consider, have a discussion about it being changed to his, her, or their. Um, yeah. Just because I think, and that's, that's I mean, th there is more male gendered language pretty much throughout, throughout the, document. the document. Yeah. <laughs> so it's well, almost well, as throughout as history. So that's, yeah, uh, it's, 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 con as it's consistent. Women yeah. didn't exist, but that's yeah. okay. Um, so, um, just, just bearing that in mind, I, I think it might be advantageous to like, what, what specificity of pronouns are appropriate and progressive or maybe yeah. not progressive, but would fully encapsulate all the people right. who could have that office. Yeah. Um, and just kind of being mindful of their personhood and how they identify. Yeah. And that's, Really, I'm not looking at this on an uh, really just uh, specifically to the articles that are part of our working group, because this is something that really impacts the entire document. This is going to be a recommendation for the entire document. Mm -hmm. And so part of the research that I'm doing is seeing how how other cities or other government bodies have addressed this, uh, created more gender inclusive language within within their their governing documents, specifically their charters or constitutions. Uh, 
I think it is. I think the default would be uh, his, her, or there. But I want to see if there's another, if there are, if there's a body of research out there that could provide some, uh, not just guidance, but also uh, uh, academic support for why we are making this change. Okay. I'm gonna pull up the charters that I've downloaded into my favorite. Okay. And see if I can identify. And again, most cities have made an attempt to amend their charters the way that we are and mm -hmm. have not been able to do so as well. So I would like us, again, like I stated last time, to be very mindful of that reality and what it looks like most of the most of the states have done is omitted the identification altogether and use words like members or position holder mm -hmm. or authorized personnel or the title mm -hmm. itself right that could work too. Right, they moved away. I, I, that's one of the things that I noticed is they moved away from pronouns and just used uh, more specific nouns. Mm -hmm. So, and I think congruently to, I'm sure bypass argument, mm -hmm. uh, that's why that was the case. Sure. So, and because most of the articles are concentrated on that particular role, mm -hmm. I think it, it could be just easier to keep it consistently referring or reflecting the title mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. the person's pronouns. Yeah. Which goes into my section of framework mm -hmm. that I was assigned. Yeah. Um, the consistency that I spoke to last week. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. My actual camera is at the bottom of my laptop instead of the top of my laptop technology. Uh, so the consistency of items and of things related to the articles. When I brought up framework, this is one of the issues that I saw was an inconsistency with where the definitions are, where the pronouns are used, because they're not used in every article. It's uh, kind of like a hierarchy situation where the pronouns are heavily used over others. And we could omit pronouns and just stick to referring to the title and the actual title description of that role versus making it male, female, or other. Yeah. Them, they, or theirs. Um, but as it relates to the framework, when I assessed all of the articles over the past two weeks, there are 11 items that are consistently referred to throughout the entire charter, but some articles don't reflect the particular section. So I'll just go through the 11 sections that I identified and that I would like to discuss with you all pertaining to a recommendation for all the articles to reflect these areas. Mm -hmm. um, section one being history, section two, chain of command, section three, qualifications and requirements, section four, duties, section five, reports, section six, term, section seven, financials, section eight, vacancies, Section nine, liabilities. Section 10, duties upon absence. And section 11, removal. Those are the high level sections that all the articles either reflect some of or all of. And only, the only one that reflects the majority is the mayor's article. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, it's some of them. So I would recommend all of the articles reflect the same sections. I also think to your point, there's some parity there with how other cities have organized theirs. 
I've I've kind of seen that alignment. It's just easier to follow. Yeah. And I think um, to the extent that we can, you know, making this document readable and easy to understand to the average person um, is is really important to me. So from an accessibility standpoint, I think that those sections that you just mentioned um, make sense. And like you mentioned, there might be some that don't necessarily fall into all of them or we might have to make some exceptions, but most of them do. Yeah, most of them apply to all the articles. It's just for whatever reason, a hundred years ago, we decided not to hmm. document the particular air areas for each article. I don't know what that was about. This was definitely before my time. Um, <laughs> but I think that we should reference each section, especially because we're dealing with the staff. Our articles are associated to the staff. Although these amendments that we're putting forth would probably reflect all the articles. I don't know for certain that each article needs all 11, but I think that it should reflect all 11 in its framework. And if it doesn't apply to a particular article that it says not applicable in that section, but I think that all the sections should reflect it. Like I see cases and ordinances in some of the articles, even definitions in some of the articles and not in all. I would recommend that we review all three for each article and make sure that they are there for people to be able to assess, access them and know whatever details associated to each article. So the consistency of the framework is, is definitely more of my concern. You know, can, uh... Chair, can you give a can you provide an example? I just I have the I have the charter in front of me. Can you give me an example of what one of the articles that you're looking at, just so I can visually see it? Yeah. So if you go to the mayor's article, the article sure. specifically for the mayor, yeah. the majority of the eleven sections are in that article. Okay. In in that article, you'll see some cases, you'll see some ordinances very few, if any, definitions. And you'll also see that some of these sections are not documented in the mayor's article, but they are in the other staff's articles. Okay. Like um, our initial public meeting, we were asking for chain of command, kind of mm -hmm. what that looks like. And mm -hmm. based on how this is written, it would be assumed that whomever the mayor reports to would be documented in this article. It's not there specifically. Got it. And so because we know the city of St. Louis is the city of St. Louis. <laughs> we have to itemize and document and communicate how we're running the city and what that looks like. So if our mayor reports to St. Louis County, it should be clear in the article that that is what that is. In the fact, if that is what that is, whatever it is, it should be documented in the article. Do so you want me to take the, the, the sections that are under uh, city officers and employees and and replicate that type of uh, consistency on, on the mayor's one? Is that yep. what I'm understanding? Okay. Yep. So the replication... And if, and if it's not if it's not applicable, then it would be not applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, based on, like I said, when I looked at them all, sure. the majority of them are applicable because they, they all require them to do, to outline the qualifications and requirements. Mm -hmm. They all require them to communicate what their duties are. They do not all require that they have items like reports or terms. But mm -hmm. as we know, that applies to the mayor's office, just like it applies to the other offices. It's just sure. not there. So there's a little bit of omittance in some of the articles across the, 
the total 26 of them. Is is it is there a difference between a person who is elected versus a person who's appointed? Because there is an entire section on elections. Mm -hmm. So would that would it, do we need to make a different uh, make a distinction between uh, elected roles and uh, appointed? The or way staff roles? it looks, it identifies which of those in like a qualifications or requirements article or section. Uh -huh section, not article, but in the section, mm -hmm. it determines whether whom's appointed or elected. Mm -hmm. It has that language in our articles. I'm not sure about everyone okay. else, but in our articles, it's clear whether it's appointed or elected. Mm -hmm. The issue is it's not its own section where you can go straight to it and determine how mm. this person is appointed, how this person is elected, those types of items. It's kind of within the double page paragraph. So then uh, just one more point of clarification. So then if I look at the registrar's uh, article, which only has two sections, you would want to expand that out as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand. Thanks. No problem. Secretary Bobo, I think we're on to you with definitions. How did that go? So I have my binder is full of my blue sticky notes. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I might uncover more as we move forward, but it's it's not, I, I think I started this out thinking, oh, this will just be words that are unclear. And I have uncovered several of those, but it, there's also just um, sections, I think, in their entirety that I, I try and put myself in the shoes of if if an average person were to pick this up, would they understand what is being said? And if I don't get it, I feel like maybe others might not either. Um, so let me find an example. So um, I'm under the mayor's section. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the actual binder itself, it says city at the bottom, it says city 023. And it's yeah. um, under the mayor, it's section 11. mayor to determine questions as to division of officers' powers. Mm -hmm. All questions between officers as to their relative powers and duties shall be determined by the mayor, except as in this charter otherwise provided. Like that just seems like a lot of fluff language that I don't quite understand. So I, I think like wherever possible, just like, what does this actually mean? What, if, if, if people are, contending what their role is. I'm assuming sh uh, she, he, or they have the power to then say, this is what I see your role as. Mm -hmm. So things like that. Um, and then, so moving to, uh, I'm gonna be jumping around quite a bit, but that's okay. Cause we have a transcription. We have a transcription. So that'll help me go back and kind of make sense of, uh, of some of this. Um, Cause I know it's very, technical. Um, there's a section under fourteen B, which is is not necessarily something I believe we had to to look at. Um, but oh article no, no. Four, uh, article fourteen B? No, article, sorry. Yeah, article fourteen B. Okay, thank you. Or no section Hold, please. <laughs> oh, this is under Board of Public Service. Board of Public Service. Which article is that? That is 13. 13, thanks. Which, okay. So I'm in section 15 of that. So Department mm -hmm. of Public Safety. And it says Division of Excise, which According to research, I'm pretty sure that's typically related to exclusively or mostly aligned with obtaining a liquor license. So the language, but the language there doesn't, doesn't, doesn't state that at all. And so I think that's just an example of wherever possible, like making the language very plain so that I know this is what the division of excise actually does. 
and what I would go to them for. Mm -hmm. um, and then yet another example is, um, this is testing my Roman numerals. Um, so I'm in this, I'm just, I'm under the section talking about uh, city bonds. If you have the, the virtual document, I'm sure it's easier to like just Google search, you know, where the, or control F and find where yeah. the where I am. But um, section two says how payment to be made, bonds to be issued as to payable serially or subject to call. No clue what that means. And um, I mean, I'm sure I could figure it out. But I just, I, I don't want there to be language that is a barrier or is um, not clear whenever possible. So those are some of the examples that I came up with. And then um, this isn't quite a definition piece, but wherever it says salary amounts, mm -hmm. I, I think we should just like remove those altogether because they're so antiquated and um, they don't account for cost of living. They don't account for where we are currently. So yeah, for I'd, example, be, I'd, be, uh, I'd be really curious as to, um, because we know the mayor's salary, the, like the salaries that are listed there that are identified in the mm -hmm. charter, that's not what people are being paid today. Right, right. So uh, what has the process been in the past is what is the, uh, to, you know, where is that? Doc I, don't, I don't necessarily need to know where it's documented, but when the mayor's, we use, keep using the mayor as the example, when the mayor's compensation had changed, why was that not updated in the charter? Or uh, is there something in the charter that does need to uh, talk about salary and compensation? Um, I think that's why I put section seven as a framework for all the articles because it's titled financials and the salaries and all of the budgets and responsibility descriptions or outlines can at least be written in the charter to reflect each article. And this is why I thought that that section was very necessary because even in the mayor's um, article where the salary is kind of a sentence and it's mentioned, mm -hmm. The mayor's salary isn't the only financial responsibility for that particular office or department. And we have, we were given a binder of the operating everything pertaining to the city that has the budgets in there. And even if it is, which is, it also goes to something I think Commissioner Gar said, where there's no way that this article, that these, that this charter can only be updated every 10 years when we're changing budgets, adding to budgets, increasing budgets, all of these kinds of things on a regular uh, annual basis, at least. The article also alludes to reports being provided annually. And in those annual reports, these items like financials are changing. Yeah, but I, I think that and we have to, I, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. It should be, those changes should reflect in the charter or be omitted from the charter as a itemized number like it has now the mayor's annual salary is ten thousand dollars if that's not in fact the case we don't want the charter to reflect something that's not accurate I just, yeah can i can i interject one second um yeah, so you. article eight section eight of the charter indicates that the salary amounts are minimums and not maximums. So with them being minimums and not maximums, how do the citizens of St. Louis know what the ceiling, if there's a ceiling, and how that is, how we get to determining what the minimum or maximum is? Well, I, so, I, I wanna, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. I, yeah. I just want to make sure that we're treating the charter, though, as a governing document and not mm -hmm. a management or operational document. Right. Like, in, so, in, I mean, because the budget, the budget is our operating document on an annual basis for the city. Uh, the and I don't think we can. I mean, the charter isn't going to be flexible enough to include everything that happens on a changing basis uh, within the within the city of St. Louis. Um, 
so any changes we make, I think we need to just keep at the governance at the governance level. Right. So if it's at a governance level, then why do we have there are sentences in here that reflect what they reflect. And that's I think that's my again the consistency with what is or isn't in the charter. This so if it's not going to be a managing document used to operate the city and it is a governing document, then the governing structure of the city of St. Louis should at minimum be in the charter. To, to answer the question you posed regarding how we know the minimums and maximums every um, year, there's a budget process that the city goes through and typically on an annual basis, but not always annually, there is a compensation ordinance that comes through the Board of Aldermen um, and the Board of Estimate and Apportionment that sets minimums and maximums for each position in the classified service. And and, and so all of that um, information comes via ordinance and the powers to create those ordinances that come from the charter originally. Okay, that's, that's good information to know. I, I also want to kind of echo some of the sentiments that vice chair has raised in that um, I do agree that this document needs to be a little bit more malleable, but at the same time, you know, I think the consensus is that every 10 years is probably standard. Otherwise you run into the risk of, if you're updating this annually or every five years, mm -hmm. um, it becomes almost a reactive document to what's being happen, what's happening versus a forward looking um, a kind of storyboard of what St. Louis could be. And so that's some, yeah. So that's just- I think that with, with that being the basis or the consensus, anything in the articles that is not mm -hmm. from a governing structure, mm -hmm. we should be discussing amending the removal of it yeah i agree but anything in it which i i can highlight i'm gonna go through and highlight the areas there's that, so much of it yeah they definitely so much management and operations mm -hmm. need to come out of the article and it transition to governing language that is definitely not how it's currently yeah written i agree so i'm completely in alignment with it functioning as a governing document, which the other six that I'm using as a reference are written as. Ours, not so much so. It's definitely written from a managing perspective, i.e. calling or referring to the manager as the CEO of the city. That's a, Those are management and operating statements. I, um, I also want to, to your end, Secretary Bobo, discuss the word power used in the articles often. Um, I'm not necessarily a fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm more so a fan of, again, sticking to what that governing department role title or whomever is actually doing because mm -hmm. that is what the charter is about. So there is argument or debate around what the charter is used for. And we have Commissioner Hamilton here that can clarify how it's used. If it's used as a means of orchestrating the city government, then that makes it a management document. If it's used as an oversight overview, kind of catch all constitution aspect, then it's a governing document. And we want to concentrate our amendments on that end. So I think if we could, by our city officials that our city staff that is here, tell us kind of how the document is used so that we can, across the board and all the work groups, amend according to the structure it, it's used for. I can speak to my office um, specifically and maybe not the city as a whole. Um, but for my office, the charter grants and limits power um, to various offices and officials. Uh, we kind of outlined a lot of those in the city government overview that was 
given by Christina Gracia and Casey Milberg. And that really lays the framework, I think, for who's in charge of what um, function of government. And that, I think, is the basic of the, the charter, right? It's the grants of power and the limitations on power um, to, to have authority and, and say over certain things. And then over time, there have been many charter amendments, whether those be by ordinances that go to the voters, by voter initiative, by, and then that's where you start seeing things that, okay, this one has this and this one doesn't have that, um, because there's different ways to amend the charter that I think where some of that comes from. Okay. So do you, in your experience, do you believe the charter is used or was written as more of a governing document or a managing document with the ordinance being added to it and it being consistently edited or revised as things come up and as things go before the city to vote on? Does it make it more of something that you are reference in order to do things? Or is it something that's just, you know, kind of there as the structural framework of how the city runs? I, I think it's a little bit of both. There's kind of a cross between um, in both, but I think it does leave flexibility for things like the budget process that we just talked about. When you say who has authority over issuing a compensation ordinance, is going to be the Civil Service Commission on the recommendation of the Director of the Department of Personnel, right? And so you know who's supposed to do it, and it has the ability to change with those folks' movements um, over time. You have the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, who, you know, that's the, the process. It kind of gives you the, the basics for who has the authority in the process. But there are some places where it's more specific as well. So I, you, and you all acknowledge that you see them both, right? In, Right. I, I think um, just to answer from a Department of Personnel standpoint, um, the charter is more of a governing document and the civil service rules and administrative guidelines are the managing tools. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the charter gives us the framework by which we operate and what our role is uh, within the city of, of St. Louis. But as you go through Article 18, what you will note is that there really is not a lot of management types of clauses or anything that's in there. It's really the framework, the framework, the structure, and the civil service rules and the administrative guidelines gives us the flexibility to be able to modernize over the years, to make changes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that that is the way in which it has, the Article 18 has been used up to this point, uh, but that is what I believe the intent is um, to serve as that governing tool. And I would say, I think if you talk to different people in different offices, they would have different perspectives on how the charters are used because the articles are different with re mm -hmm. relationship to all of um, the offices. And like I said, there's been those amendments over time that try to get the specificity in. And from a legal standpoint, the way, you know, the charter trumps an ordinance, right? So if there are a bunch of ordinances you don't like, uh, it, you do a voter initiative that undoes them all because it's in the charter, right? So. And I think that's more of where I'm, I'm trying to get uh, the commission to understand is the ordinance, the ordinances that come about over the years allude to management additions being added to the charter in order to enforce the charter's governing framework. So typically both happen simultaneously. And based on the explanations we just got, it's important for us to know as a commission that both of these things happen collectively. And the people that are working on behalf of the charter provide the charter with its managing kind of structure. The charter operates as the framework, and then everyone working on behalf of the charter um, passes ordinances or needs items to be identified in the charter that reflect what they're actually doing versus what the charter may or may not say. So I think from my perspective, 
is I just want enough of what everyone needs the charter to reflect to actually be a part of the governing language that's in the charter versus the city coming at this uh, combative reactive process over the years of having to add to it on a regular basis, if that makes sense. So that it's not a reactive document, it's actually something that we've thought long and hard about what needs to be included in it. And so that's where I went with, okay, let's get the structured framework of these sections that should be in there. Because I'm what I'm hearing is over time, they have to come back and add to it so that the charter reflects how they can do what they need to do. That was all I had to say. That was my synopsis. If you guys don't have anything else to add, I think the only, we needed to do our, if there were any special meeting requests, I know that that's on the agenda whenever I find it. Oh, I'm not gonna find it in there because that's not where I'm supposed to be over here. Okay. So we went through the previous working group has special meeting requests. That's where we are on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Do you all have any special meeting requests that you would like by way of this month's work group work that we've done both in the background? And during these meetings, I know that I wanted to request a special meeting from the Board of Aldermen. But did you guys have any any special meeting requests? I don't have any. I don't either. Okay. Just for my knowledge is your meeting request um, with the Board of Aldermen kind of to understand a little bit more of the question you posed earlier of maybe how they're using the document currently? Yes, how they're using the document, how it affects the Board of Aldermen and how it, yeah, how it affects and how it impacts what they're doing and how they're doing what they're doing. So I'm more so interested in the cause of the cause and effect of the charter so that the amendments reflect that aspect, the governing aspect of things so that we can, again, remove the, the management kind of approach to it. I also want to get ahead of not having our debate and discussion and conversation being about the managing end of things because yeah. I can see that things will go in that direction and we really want to stay focused on the governing structure framework and body of the charter and not get caught in the weeds of the managing activities that are not a part of what we were appointed for so I want the special meeting for the Board of Aldermen related to what the cause and effect of the charter is on their work, on their efforts, on their department, for lack of better words. And are you, when you say special meeting, are you talking about inviting a particular person in the Board of Aldermen to this work group meeting or the whole, everybody on the Board of Aldermen to some other meeting? If we could get everyone or as many Board of Aldermen officials or the president of the Board of Aldermen is fine to do a separate um, special meeting outside of this work group meeting. Do they have the same non-quorum rules, though, uh, Counselor? Like, they can't all be at a meeting and it... They would not be doing Board of Aldermen business. They would be here as your guests. Okay. Your on to your Got you know it. they wouldn't be doing all their they wouldn't be doing the board's work they would be here yeah. doing charter commission work okay i just wanted to confirm that thanks that is the only special meeting request and you would want that special meeting to be public anyway right 
Yes. Yeah. All meetings, public, so we can not have any issue related to what is or is not public. So also, all meetings, go ahead. From my knowledge, too, um, what is your expectation on timeline for that? I asked because um, I know the board, board of aldermen, well, the the board of alder people, I should say, mm -hmm. um, they, they, they're very, you know, I, I want to be mindful of their schedules too. And I don't want to run into the kind of the, some of the same hurdle that we had um, asking for uh, Dr. San, Sandoval and I'm, blanking on um, some of the others who came. I just want to be mindful to give them enough notice so that they can thoroughly prepare and kind of know what's to be expected. It's um, for, it, the special meeting will be for November and it's whenever they are available. Like we made the attempt for the last special meetings that we had, but the board, the board of aldermen would let us know when they can meet and that will that will be how it's scheduled. Not so much so on our availability, but on theirs. And when they have the capabilities of having that meeting. So if they can't do November, then they will do December. I'm not really concerned with when it happens. I just want it to happen so that it's something that we can reference because we are amending the Board of Aldermen's article. And we want to know from them what again, what those, what cause and effect issues related to their department may be. And when you say, I just want to clarify, when you say agenda, you're talking about the November 1 public meeting agenda where you guys have to um, make statements to the full group about the special meetings you want to request. And you're saying you want to put forward a motion at that November 1 meeting that the board, the, the commission um, invite the board of aldermen to attend and create a special meeting time and work, you know, okay, I, yes. I, I, I understand. Yes. So it's gonna be the same hour, Commissioner Bobo. It won't be any more or any longer than that. And it'll still be at their convenience of when they can meet and what day and time works best for them. And I will make sure that I'm there since I am putting forth the motion to request it but everyone else, just like the other special meetings, can watch it on YouTube at their convenience as well. Yeah, I wasn't, just to clarify, I wasn't so much concerned about my time because actually my time gets more free towards the end of the year, knock on wood. Um, so I was just more trying to be as, as amenable and thoughtful as a host that, you know, when they are available and kind of making that clear to them. So I think we're, we're good there. I don't want to belabor the point. Yeah, okay. The next item is the next set of amendment tasks. So we'll meet again at our next scheduled task, at our next scheduled time. Sorry. What did you all want to have completed by then? I know that Commissioner Sheridan still has to or wants to do more research on the pronouns, the use of or not use. Yeah, but I'll. I'll have that. I'll have that to share. I'll I'll provide that a written summation in advance of the November four meeting. I believe is the date. November. Okay. okay. November, November eighth. I'm sorry. November eighth. No, wait. When is our next meeting? Public meeting. November. The pu the regular meeting. All these meetings are public. The next regular meeting yeah. is set for November first. The next meeting November first. That's right. Yeah. Group is November the eighth. That's right. Uh, so I, I'm going to, I'm getting ready to send an email. I will be out of the country from the 31st through the 10th. So no, October 31st through November 10th. Okay. So for November, for the November 1st meeting, Commissioner Sheridan will have his recommendations emailed to us related to. Language in the charter. Gender neutral language. Okay. Commissioner Bobo, what about you? Um, so, I mean, I've gone through and like I mentioned, sticky noted things, but I think you brought up some points that I hadn't considered, like really making very plain the word power, things like that. Um, and so I'll also type up my, my thoughts, um, and put them into a document and share via email. Um, 
I, I will say not by next meeting, but certainly by our next special working group meeting. So by the November 8th meeting, um, I'll have that to you all. So that means um, Vice Chair Sheridan, you can um, review it upon your return. Great, thanks. Okay, and I will document the framework and the sections that I came up with and have them sent to everyone by the November 1st meeting as well. And then we'll be working on a new set of, at the November 8th meeting, we'll, after the discussion with the total commission, we'll either add those recommendations to our article draft or continue to discuss and debate, or we can move on to the next set of amendments that we recommend to our set of articles. I'm thinking the November 8th meeting will spend seeing the draft changes and the framework changes and just writing them out or drafting them out. So I'll try to do most of the drive, the draft setup for our articles for the November 8th meeting. And I know Commissioner Sheridan, you won't be there, but the two of us we'll see the, we'll see a, a draft of what we've mm -hmm. done so far and we'll just continue to add to it at our, you know, step at yeah. a time. Yep. Am I, am I, this is totally off topic, but am I right that both the chair and the vice chair are gonna be absent for the November one meeting? You know, I just thought about that because I too am gonna be out of the country, um, Commissioner Sheridan. And Where are you going? I'm going to Spain. <laughs> no, I'm going to the same place. I hope. <laughs> I'm going. I I'm, going to, I'm going to Spain. I'll be there at oh. four ten days too. But I, because our rules don't address who presides over the meeting in the absence of both the chair and the vice chair. So we got to talk about that. So do we talk about that on here? We talk about it all. We don't have to. We at I mean at some point we I'm just realizing it whenever just right now. So yeah. Okay. So let me let me contemplate. I may be able to move some things. But... I too will be out of the country. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't play like that. I'm sorry. I may be able to move uh some things because I can uh, you know I'm pretty flexible with how things happen in my life, but I may be able to move some things. If I can't, then Shin, I think we can have a discussion okay. offline about who would preside the meeting for the two of us in absence. We probably okay. can do that anyway, but I think this, he like we stated, it's the only meeting that that's going to be the case. Um, yeah. So we can discuss that. That's fine. Okay. Secretary Bubble, you know you're next in line, so don't be surprised. Wonderful. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just have the, uh, we'll have the Speaker of the House do it. Oh, wait, there's not one of those either. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Bubble will be next in line. She'll have everything that she needs. I've done a thorough report of things. And the agenda is pretty straightforward. Everybody's just discussing their articles and what their work yeah. did for this month. So it's okay. not, you know, I did the, the parliamentarian piece. So he's going to have all the motions and all of that. Okay, got it. So I'll look for that for that email recap. Um, and y'all just say a prayer. Amen, amen. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right um, yeah. Anything else for today? I'm going to add some notes to our agenda. Okay. I saw you in there too, Commissioner Sheridan. Um, I'm going to add some notes to it and we're just send our update as a work group. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary Bubba, did you want to send the work group update to everyone? with Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll need to review this transcript one more time because I was also taking my notes for me as at the same time, so... Me too. So I have okay. the computer up, my notebook, and notepad. <laughs> so yeah. if we can send that to all the commissioners so they understand what our recommendations are and they too can do the same and everyone will at least know what each working group's 
concepts around recommendations are for this month. And then we prepared for November 1st. Got it. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.